Welcome, everyone. Welcome. My name is Barbara Will. I am a professor of English at Dartmouth and the Associate Dean of the Arts and Humanities. I'm so pleased to welcome you here to the second lecture in our series entitled, Why the Humanities Matter in the 21st Century. This is a two-year lecture series of distinguished speakers looking at the most pressing issues of our day through the perspective and insight unique to the humanities. Supported and funded by the President's Office, this series is meant to showcase great thinkers in the humanities who are actively helping us envision a better, more engaged, more responsible future. Last fall, we heard from Bill Derezowitz, author of Excellent Sheep, on the future of elite liberal arts education in an era of increasing pre-professionalism. Next year, we are inviting Drew Faust, president of Harvard, to speak in this series. And today, we have the great pleasure of, of hearing from one of America's most important public intellectuals, Dr. Cornell West. To introduce Dr. West, I'm going to hand the podium over to Randall Balmer, the John Phillips Professor and Chair of the Religion Department at Dartmouth College. Randall. Our speaker this afternoon has peerless academic credentials, both as a student and teacher. Princeton, Yale, Harvard, Union Theological Seminary, and he is about to top off that very impressive CV by teaching at Dartmouth this summer. <laughs> Cornell West is a public intellectual, which is to say that he is willing to take his scholarship beyond the boundaries of the insular academy and enter the arena of public discourse. A public intellectual is an exceedingly rare breed. Most of us prefer the safety of recondite conversations with an increasingly narrow circle of specialists. And if you doubt that public intellectuals are a rare breed, I invite you to name others beyond this afternoon's speaker. I suspect you won't need more than one hand. In addition to being a public intellectual, however, Cornell West is a prophet, a truth teller to the core. A prophet calls us to account and even to repentance. Professor West is a prophet firmly rooted in the Christian tradition, someone who embraced the faith at Shiloh Baptist Church on what he calls the chocolate side of Sacramento, California. But he's not a provincial prophet. He is a Catholic, lowercase c, prophet. Someone who draws from diverse sources, from the New Testament and Ralph Waldo Emerson, from W.E.B. Du Bois and Fannie Lou Hamer and Gwendolyn Brooks and Curtis Mayfield, and even the one candidate in the presidential scrum just passed whose moral compass pointed true north, an ethnically Jewish, functionally atheist, democratic socialist from Vermont. <laughs> Professor West's topic this afternoon is intellectual vocation and political struggle in the Trump moment. We're living in dark days. What Professor West calls the age of spiritual blackout. Indeed, the storm clouds on the horizon look even more ominous than in the days of Nixon. But as Leonard Cohen reminds us, even in the darkness, there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. I'm confident this afternoon that Brother West will point us toward the light. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. 
and what an honor for me to return to Dartmouth and those generous words brother Randy oh my god my god my god well you're very kind though you stretched the truth but I'll accept a slice of it I'll accept a slice of it though but let me first say that I've had such a great time with the students just a few minutes ago we had a candid and a very honest conversation about education and truth and struggle. I want to salute those students who were part of that conversation and I hope that you will raise your voices because we will have a dialogue right after my presentation and I am in no rush whatsoever. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. I don't have to be back. We've got a wonderful Dalit conference at Brandeis tomorrow with our precious so-called untouchables, as unseeables and unapproachables brothers and sisters in India. And I don't have to be there until 2.30, so <laughs> we got a lot of time together. I want to salute my dear sister, Barbara Will, for being so very kind. Where, where is she? Where's Dean Will? There she is. I want to salute my dear sister for being so kind. <laughs> Definitely. And Sister Sarah Coulter. I know she, oh, there she is. Give it up for Sister Sarah Coulter. <laughs> and she's standing next to Maria Cole, who is a distinguished graduate of Dartmouth, and I've been blessed to work with her for the last four or five years as part of my, uh, my office. She's, we, call her, we call her executive assistant, but she's a uh, visionary figure behind it. Give it up for Sister Maria Cole. <laughs> and she is here with Nikita McPherson, who was the president of the Black Student Association in 2013. And she facilitated shutting some things down, as I recall, and I'll stand in solidarity with her. Where is she? Where is she? Where is she? There she is. There she is. And anytime I come to Dartmouth, I always salute my dear brother Donald Pease. Oh, I don't, oh there he is. Oh, love you, brother. Respect you, brother. Give it up for this legendary figure. <laughs> I didn't know you were here. Oh, we go back 35 years of Boundary 2 and towering figures like William Spanos. William Spanos is the greatest literary critic wrestling with the greatest American novelist, Herman Melville. And Paul Beauvais and Jonathan Eric, those were magnificent days. We shall never ever forget those precious memories. And I heard you give a paper on the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel in Los Angeles. And he was standing by me because I had a number of folk protesting against me. I said, ooh, I've got to listen to my critics, but I think I'm doing the right thing <laughs> when you have critics trying to uh, shut you down. But there was a beautiful moment because the magnificent Susanna Heschel who is a professor here. Give it up for Sister Susanna Hesham. I don't know if she's here or not, but you, you tell her I send my love and respect. But she was there, and she, she stood next to me, and she stood by me, and it made a difference. And Donald Pease was there standing by me as well, just committing themselves to a robust conversation. Of course, I have no monopoly on truth. You can see I have no monopoly on beauty. <laughs> but I am involved in a quest for truth and goodness and justice. And as a Christian, based on that rich prophetic legacy of Jerusalem, love of the holy. So I want to begin on a very personal note, very existential note. Before we get into talking about vocation and talking about struggle and my dear brother Donald Trump in the White House. <laughs> And he is my brother. He's made in the image of God, just like, just like all of us. He's just chosen to act like a gangster sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> a 
And that's all right. I was a gangster before I met Jesus, and I'm a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. So <laughs> I understand gangsters. But I want to get on this note of acknowledging, after that wonderful introduction, that the, I am who I am because somebody loved me, and somebody cared for me, and somebody targeted me. I take very seriously a revolutionary notion of piety. And piety is not uncritical deference. The dogma is not blind obedience. The doctrine, it is the acknowledgement of the sources of good in our lives given our brief trek from our mama's womb to tomb. And so the highest honor I have ever received has nothing to do with Harvard, or Yale, or Princeton, or University of Paris, or the Grand Union Theological Seminary, but it is being the second son of Irene B. West and Clifton West. And dad is now gone 24 years ago. Mom stronger than ever. <laughs> First grade teacher and principal at an elementary school named after her, Irene B. West, right outside of Sacramento, California. And I say that because when we talk about the Trump era, we have to follow Amikar Cabral and Amy Césaire in returning to the source. What kind of human beings are we really? What has gone into the shaping and molding of who we all are? What Antonio Gramsci called an historical, critical self-inventory. What kind of intellectual, spiritual, moral, political resources do we have available? both as persons as well as communities and traditions. And I follow the grand lead of my teacher, Hans Georg Gadamer, who was blessed to study with for a year at Boston College, author of Truth and Method, the inescapability of traditions. And I say traditions with an S. But Frederick Jameson is right. You historicize, you contextualize, and you pluralize. And that's true with ourselves as well. No one of us have one identity, but a variety of identities as we attempt to choose certain visions and virtues and values. So yes, it's the West family and Shiloh Baptist Church on that chocolate side of Sacramento at 9th Avenue in Oak Park. We had a legendary pastor, Willie P. Cook, and he was a pastor, he was not a CEO. And that's very important. <laughs> the churches have been commodified, commercialized, and marketized, so the pastors become CEOs and the choirs become praise teams. <laughs> and that blood at the cross becomes Kool-Aid just to dip in in order to get your next commodity-driven blessing. <laughs> so I want to be candid of where I come from. We had the Black Panther Party right next door. It meant the world to me in terms of those precious children coming to the breakfast program. I could never join because I'm a Jesus-loving free black man, but I was in deep solidarity and remain so with the focus on those poor, precious, priceless children. And even today, one out of two black and brown children under six live in poverty richest nation in the world, still morally obscene, still spiritually profane. It was not just Shiloh and the Black Panther Party, but at Harvard College, the teachers made a difference. The John Rawls and Robert Nozicks and Hillary Putnams and Israel Shefflers and Samuel Beers and Martin Kilsons and Preston Williams and Judas Slars, they took me seriously. And we were talking about this with the dialogue with the young folk, that by the time I arrived at Harvard, I already had in place a certain kind of spiritual fortitude. And by fortitude, I don't mean just courage, but the fusion of courage and magnanimity of courage and a quest for greatness of character, greatness manifest not like Alexander the Great, not like Julius Caesar, not like Charlemagne, not like Napoleon, but like Jesus, like Amos, like Martin King, like Fannie Lou Hamer, like Grace Boggs, 
like Dorothy Day, like Rabbi Abraham, Joshua Heschel, like Edward Said. I could go on and on. I'm talking about people on the love train. <laughs> love warriors, different than polished professionals. Oh, young brothers and sisters of all colors here at Dartmouth always remember the difference between what it means to really fall in love with the quest for truth and goodness and beauty as opposed to falling in love with commodities and possessions and status. And we all fall short. Samuel Beckett says, we try again, fall, fail again, fail better. Try again, fail again, fail better. But in the moment in which we find ourselves, we need a focus on those particular traditions, secular and religious, that highlight a quest for integrity, honesty, decency, and fortitude, courage, and magnanimity. That's why I want to begin with my epigraph. I haven't got to my epigraph yet here. My epigraph comes from probably the greatest democratic and public intellectual in the history of the American empire in the 20th century, and he's got some candidates. John Dewey was in a league of his own in many ways, Edmund Wilson and Susan Sontag, Mario Rookeyes and Lionel Trilling, Ryan Hole, Nebo, oh, there's some candidates. But I still go with W.B. Du Bois. W.B. Du Bois, in 1951, handcuffs, standing in court, working with the World Peace Center, charged to be working as a foreign agent on behalf of the Soviet Union, is just trying to rid the world of nuclear weapons supported by Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell and others. He finally found a house, in the greatest borough in the world, Brooklyn, <laughs> 31 Grace Court, which was the house of the great Arthur Miller, my dear brother who I've blessed to know well, a towering figure, not just of the stage, but of American arts, who facilitated Du Bois moving into his house. Passport taken away. One visitor, Paul Robeson, his passport taken away. He living under house arrest in Philadelphia at his sister's house, 4645 Walnut Street. When Du Bois turns to Shirley, his magnificent intellectual firebrand that she was, he said, I got to write a letter to the younger generation because there may come a time in the history of this fragile experiment in democracy, this empire, and we have to be able to think two ideas at the same time, fragile experiment in democracy and empire simultaneously. We've got to be true to the experiences with indigenous peoples and black peoples and red peoples with moving borders when Texas and California, New Mexico used to be Mexico. And we've got to be true to the experiences of, yes, those Europeans, some of whom are escaping vicious persecution, be it religious persecution with the wave of the first wafts, or be it ugly, ethnic, racial, class persecution and exclusion, be it our precious Irish brothers and sisters dealing with British imperial policies that help facilitate that famine. Or be it those southern Italians in Sicily and other places. Or be it the Jewish brothers and sisters escaping Jew-hating Europe, Jew-hating Russia. W.B. Du Bois said, I'm going to write a love letter because America may have to come to terms with another wave of the rule 
of big money, big business, big corporations. America may have to come to terms with the rule of politicians who are able to very cleverly deploy xenophobic appeal and end up trying to convince our fellow citizens to scapegoat the most vulnerable rather than confront the most powerful. America may have to come to terms with that spiritual blackout Brother Randy was talking about. The relative eclipse of integrity, honesty, decency, and courage slash fortitude across political and ideological lines. It's not a question of just having a correct analysis. It's a question of being a caring, compassionate, and a self-critical human being who is in the struggle for the long term. And du Bois embarks on the writing of three novels. Isn't that something at 83 years old? The love letter that he writes, three novels. <laughs> the Black Flame. And you turn to that first novel, The Ordeal of Mansart. <clears throat> Page 275, he said, these are the questions that I've been wrestling with. And I hope those of the younger generation will continue to wrestle with these questions in subsequent years as they come to terms with various forms of neoliberal or what looks as if what's emerging in the neo-fascist regime. We shall see. We've got evidence of it already. Disregard of rule of law, disregard of constitutional practices and procedures and so on. First question, Du Bois says, how shall integrity face oppression? How shall integrity face oppression? Now, Du Bois already acknowledges that he himself comes from a tradition of black people who have been terrorized for 400 years, traumatized for 400 years, hated for 400 years, and yet taught the world so much about how to love. We just celebrated the 100th anniversary of Ella Fitzgerald. <coughs> Joy and love in every note. John Cole trains love supreme. I could just turn it on and sit down. <laughs> it's true. It's beyond language. Has there ever been a character on the American stage with more love than Mama in A Raisin in the Sun written by a genius from Chicago named Lorraine Hansberry? Transgenerational love flowing through her with unbelievable dignity. And we should note those who are graduating here at Dartmouth very soon, and I salute you, congratulate you. But Mama didn't go to college, but a college went through her. So what you mean, Brother West? She said, nobody has a right to graduate from college if they haven't learned how to die in order to learn how to live. And that's what Mama did. She learned how to die by critically examining her assumptions and presuppositions. And when you let some of those assumptions and presuppositions go, when you let certain prejudices and prejudgments go, that's a form of death. There's no growth. There's no maturation. There's no development. And as a Christian, of course, for me, no rebirth without death. That wonderful eulogy that Dorothy Day wrote for Martin Luther King Jr., April 5th, 1968. Martin Luther King Jr. learned how to die daily. What a gift. Kenosis, emptying himself by critically examining who he was so that he could grow and ascend. Now, of course, Stanley Cavell and others call it Emersonian perfectionism. The ascension of a self, and you're reliant on that self in order to do be what? In the world, but not of the world, and nonconformist over against the world as you never attain the ultimate self that you would like, but you're forever in process. Now, that's called the Emersonian, New England-like version of Protestant Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> that's really what it is. I mean, it is a, and we can argue. <laughs> Christians certainly have no monopoly on it. It's a certain way of being in the world. Integrity facing oppression. And the first challenge is spiritual integrity. 
What is spiritual integrity? It is a thoroughgoing self-investment and self-involvement and a willingness to understand a particular situation in light of his genealogy, in light of his diagnosis, and the projection of a prognosis in a fallible mode. You could be wrong. But then choosing as a form of life that the conclusion will be like a practical Aristotelian syllogism, not a proposition, but a life lived. Deeds, actions, taking risk, going to the edge of one's own abyss, and through a connection with the best of one's tradition, stepping out on nothing and yet still landing on something. And the Bois comes from a people taught the world so much about the connection between voice and vocation and love. And as Martin used to say, justice being what love looks like in public. Justice and love not identical, but indivisible. Or as the great Niebuhr used to say, any justice that's only justice soon degenerates into something less than justice. If it's not grounded in love, it runs out of gas. Du Bois was very aware and juxtaposed the integrity, cupidity, love of money, venality, everybody for sale, everything for sale ubiquitous commodification across the board, from family, church, mosque, synagogue, university, college. The market model has become so hegemonic that it is normalized and naturalized. And Du Bois says, be Socratic, contest it, interrogate it, examine it, historicize it, contextualize it. It doesn't have to be that way. And one of the reasons why we ended up with the xenophobic, mendacious, and men mediocrity is a kind of quasi compliment to Brother Trump. Because <laughs> America does have a long tradition of white male mediocrity in high places. <laughs> no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. Family connections and cronyism and nepotism, but Trump makes that look bad. <laughs> he does. And that's just at the level of knowledge and competence. It's not at the level of what I call gangster, grabbing a woman's private parts, that's gangster, taking somebody's oil, that's not your oil, that's gangster, that's not my subjective expression, that's an objective condition. The use of arbitrary power, thinking that Thrasymachus is right in the Republic rather than Socrates, thinking somehow that even quasi-Nietzschean wills to power don't warrant certain kind of interrogation because of a lack of moral and spiritual dimensions. That's gangster. And that has become a model for too many in the American empire and around the world. And Du Bois says, what about integrity? What about moral consistency? Has cupidity and venality so thoroughly devoured our culture that those who talk about integrity are outdated and antiquated? It's certainly countercultural. In corporate media, how much integrity do we see in corporate media? Hardly any at all. It's too much money. See, I used to see it in the church, black church. Where has the black church been in the last 25, 30 years? Dominant form, well adjusted to injustice. Well adapted to indifference. The great, the most adorable of all public philosophers, William James used to say, indifference is the one trait that makes the very angels weep. Heschel says indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. Becomes a whole way of life. That's what we're dealing with, young people. That's what has been bequeathed to you at its worst. But Du Bois is trying to keep track of your access to the best. 
that Socratic legacy of Athens that said the unexamined life is not worth living in that 38A of Plato's Apology, that says you might be unpopular, but it ought to be a result like Socrates of Parhesia, that line 24A of Plato's Apology. That frank speech, plain speech, fearless speech, unintimidated speech in a fallible mode, but still a speech that would get you in trouble. He was on his way to the hemlock. That prophetic legacy of Jerusalem that says the spreading of hesed, of loving kindness to the orphan and widow and the fatherless and motherless, to the vulnerable, the weak, the poor, those rebuked and scorned and spit on and dishonored and devalued and demeaned. Yes, Du Bois says we somehow have to keep traditions alive that connect to those legacies. And of course, the West has no monopoly on it, given its vicious histories of genocide. We just had celebration last week. Well, I shouldn't say celebration, acknowledgement, commemoration the worst of the human spirit in terms of genocidal attacks impresses Jewish brothers and sisters, and Armenians as well. And how do we build on sensitivities of those catastrophes and come to terms with the catastrophes in our own day? And I submit we shouldn't begin with Donald Trump. We don't want to fetishize Donald Trump. You don't want to ascribe magical powers to Donald Trump. Donald Trump is as American as cherry pie. He comes out of a long tradition of white supremacy and male supremacy and homophobia. He comes out of a long tradition of spiritual emptiness and moral vacuity. He comes out of a long tradition. And he's a human being. He's on a continuum with us. We don't like to say that. <laughs> but I'm here to remind you. Oh, yes, yeah, since he has a black man in America for 63 years, Trump is not news. 244 years of white supremacist slavery, the average slave dying at 26 and a half years old, working sun up to sun down as a form of torture. Couldn't worship God without white supervision in the land of religious liberty. Oh, that's catastrophic. How did they fight back? They stole away at night, held hands in a ring shout, and lifted their voices and sang, sweet, swing low, sweet chariot, refusing to respond to the cowardly gangsters who were enslaving them in a gangster-like way, just like Emmett Till's mama that said, right with his body standing, a lane in front of her, tears flowing, her only child, I don't have a minute to hate. I will pursue justice for the rest of my life. You don't do that by yourself. That's not an isolated individual act. Something has been shaped as a soul craft there. That's what spiritual integrity is. It's a soul craft there. That's what I liked about Brother Bernie Sanders. He's my dear secular Jewish Brooklyn Vermont living brother. Didn't have to agree with everything. No, no, I, I, we, we, Brother Bernie and Sister Jane, we pushing each other over and over again on empire and a whole host of other issues. But the one thing you could not deny, especially lined up against the other candidates, he had more integrity. He, was, he, was, he, he refused to sell his soul for a mess of pottage. He knew that Trump's populist language was, was pseudo-populism. He knew that Wall Street would still be in the driver's seat. He knew that Goldman Sachs would still have access in the way it did, it, and even more so now, under Barack Obama. He could see through the neoliberalism of the Democratic Party, and he could see through the escalating neo-fascist sensibilities of Donald Trump and company. So, so when you talk about integrity at the highest levels of politics, of elected officials. Oh, it's pretty cold up there. <laughs> and that's a sad thing. Because when I was coming around, when I was coming up, me and Brother Don were coming up, there were a lot of figures in national life of the country that had integrity. It wouldn't sell out, and it wasn't just a political and ideological matter. They were true to themselves. 
even William Buckley with his right wing self. <laughs> he had integrity. He's just wrong most of the time. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And of course, I'm deeply committed to the brother of Rush Limbaugh's and legatees of the right wing of fighting for their right to be wrong. Because I have libertarian sensibilities in terms of commitment to a robust public conversation where people enter that space without humiliation, with respect. I'm not talking about just the hate speech folk like this brother Milo that got, that got attacked in Berkeley. It's wrong to attack him, but he doesn't need to be either at Dartmouth or Berkeley. He doesn't have the, the stuff to be part of a high quality conversation. So he don't invite defenders of <laughs> earth is flat in a serious discussion of physics. I mean, you, get, you got to have some criteria, <laughs> but you don't attack the brother, not at all. You just let him stay home. <laughs> it's true, just let him stay home. But integrity has consequences. And most importantly, it means that you're choosing to be a long distance runner. One of the things that I loved about the conversation with the young folk, we were talking about the Dartmouth Action Collective, I think it was, Mrs. Michaela and the others were so wonderful. And they were really going at me in some magnificent ways. I like that kind of <laughs> Socratic energy coming at me. You know, Nietzsche used to say, it's not just a question of having the courage of your convictions, but the courage to attack your convictions. That's part of learning how to die. That's what education is about, too, being unsettled and unearthed and unhoused in that way. But the question is, with integrity, it's like Jane Austen's constancy. Will you be a long distance runner in your calling, in your vocation, at this particular bleak moment where it looks as if all hope is being cast aside? And the voice is saying, I've been there before. Like John Milton, Paris, Paradise Lost. What are the conditions under which ordinary people consent to their own servitude? That's a profound question. We do not yet have a definitive response. Just like Plato telling us Democrats, small d, you will never ever be able to sustain a democratic experiment because the demos is shot through with unruly passion and ubiquitous ignorance and it will generate a strong man in the patriarchal form, given that vicious legacy of patriarchy, and it will generate tyranny. Every democracy has within it the seeds of a tyrant because the demos don't have the capacity to rule themselves. We have yet to provide a definitive response to Plato, as profound and as wrong as I think he is. <laughs> because in our democratic forms, what do we still have? The oligarchs and plutocrats. In our democratic forms, what do we still have? Too much xenophobia, hatred of trans and gays and lesbians, not staying in contact with working people's humanity, bosses ruling over workers as if they're masters vis-a-vis slave-like persons. We still got empires, even as democracies were expanding. And Plato said, I told you so. <laughs> you know, believed all that Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walt Whitman, Muriel Root Kaiser, James Baldwin democratic mess. You're going to end up with even tighter forms of oligarchic rule, given your belief in the capacity of ordinary people. That's Plato always whispering in the ears of we radical Democrat small d who refuse his conclusions but have to come to terms with his challenges. Can there be a livable answer to Du Bois' question of integrity facing oppression? And what is the difference? between vocation and profession, what is the difference between calling and career? It has everything to do with that kenosis, that self-emptying. 
something so magnificent about, for me, the greatest tradition of spiritual fortitude in the modern world, which is a black musical tradition. It's never been a tradition on such intimate terms of catastrophe and still able to generate such unbelievable forms of creativity, compassion, and fortitude. And Du Bois understood that in that last chapter of Souls of Black Folk, the Sorrow Songs. One of the saddest moments in the last 30 years is the erosion of spiritual integrity of the younger generation, the erosion of the quality of black music in the last 25 years, the non-existence almost of the lifting of tender and sweet and gentle voices that sing together in tune. So I come from the Germanics and the Delphonics and the Whispers, the main ingredient, the Isley Brothers and the Jones Girls and Emotions of the Hutchison Sisters and David Ruffin and the Temptations of Smokey Robertson and the Miracles. Those aren't just entertainers. <laughs> they are love warriors in song and they listen to each other's voices with a gentleness and they raise their voices not in order to give attention to themselves for a bigger market presence, but to empower others. So James Brown would go for four hours and he would always end every concert. I was there every night. I'm an extension of you, you're an extension of me. I don't exist without you. Did anybody come here? to hear a song we didn't play. I know we've been going for four and a half hours, but did anybody come to hear a song? You didn't play Soul Power. Hit it, Bootsy. <laughs> <laughs> That's kenosis. That's serving others, giving of oneself, using what gifts you have in order to provide some light in a bleakness, in a darkness. That's what integrity is. Those who are committed to integrity are always up against the grain. And in my own language, you're choosing the way of the cross. And that cross signifies unarmed truth. And the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. It's unconditional, unapologetic love. And that love is manifest in a willingness to pay a major price in saying what you say. I mean, I know a lot of people have been very, very harsh with me trying to hold on to integrity during the age of Obama. Tied to Wall Street, drone strikes. I called George Bush a war criminal after 45 drone strikes. Obama had 506. So they got surprised. Why'd you call him a war criminal? Moral consistency. <laughs> How many innocent did he kill? How many children were killed? Let's keep track. We didn't keep track of how many Iraqis died. We didn't keep track of how many Afghanistan died. We didn't keep track of the hundreds of thousands of Muslims who have been killed since the US invasion and occupation given the gangster attack on us in New York. Those Muslim lives have the same value as any other human life. And we wonder why does the gangster respond? It's true. Oh, no, we can't talk about that with the Nobel Prize win Peace Prize winner. 26,172 bombs dropped in 2016. Over 12,000 bombs dropped in Syria last year under the Obama administration. And Trump, Trump dropped some bombs wrong, moving toward war criminal status. We get all upset. Where is our consistency? Those lives in Syria, where would the focus on Libya when those lives were going? We're undergoing such ugly treatment. And oh my God, when we get to the Middle East, and that's always difficult, how do we hold on to our spiritual integrity and tell the world we will ensure that there's never another vicious wholesale attack on precious Jewish brothers and sisters as has been the case so often for 2,000 years. But at the same time, when they choose to occupy a people, when they choose to align themselves with the US empire that loses sight with the Palestinian brothers and sisters, that Palestinian baby in Gaza has exactly the same value as that precious Jewish baby in Tel Aviv. 
And no matter how unpopular it is, and this is a, it's a, delicate, it's a delicate issue. It's hard to stay on that tightrope because there's so many anti-Jewish pitfalls in it, given how pervasive anti-Jewish prejudice and hatred is. But anti-Semitism must never be an excuse that loses sight of occupied peoples, of Palestinian peoples who are undergoing levels of social misery because like Kashmir, like in the Western Sub-Sahara with Morocco occupying, like Tibet under Chinese occupation, occupation lacks moral and spiritual integrity. It's wrong, it's unjust, it's illegal, and if we don't come to terms with it, you're going to reap what you sow like any other historical moment. And thank God. We're seeing a moral and a spiritual awakening tied to integrity. I was just with my brothers and sisters of If Not Now, among the young Jewish population. Some of them had mothers and fathers inside of APEC, but they were standing for spiritual integrity. They're not just trying to be sensitive because it's a nice issue to, to be popular about. No. No, no. Wipe away all deodorized bureaucratic discourses of diversity and inclusivity. <laughs> Talk about integrity. Talk about integrity. And I was blessed to be there. What you doing here, Brother West? I'm trying to be a person of integrity. If there was a Palestinian occupation of Jewish brothers and sisters, I'd be at the same march with the same sense of righteous indignation because it's wrong. When you have 550 Palestinian babies killed in 51 days, and hardly anybody can raise their voices, not a moaning word from any major elite, that's a sign of a lack of moral integrity. Somebody's scared. Somebody doesn't want to tell the truth. Somebody doesn't want to be unpopular. Oh, Du Bois says, echoing Martin Luther King Jr., I'd rather be dead than afraid. And when you get so fearful, you're already spiritually dead anyway. Already. Now, these other three questions will be much shorter, though. <laughs> <laughs> because you all are so kind. And, uh, that second question of Du Bois is, what does honesty do in the face of deception? What does it mean to be an honest human being? Again, cuts across politics, religion. Wonderful essay of Kierkegaard. He says, all of my work in many ways comes down to attempt to be honest. And he says, I'm sorry that's not a Christian virtue. I'll go with the pagans on that. <laughs> but that's all I want to be. Talking about faith, hope, and love. Indeed, those Christian virtues. Talking about the cardinal virtues of prudence and temperance. And justice and courage. But just to be honest, we live in an age of massive Mendacity and criminality. It's very difficult for honesty to surface. And in the Trump era, it's not just fake news, because fake news is very misleading. That, leads, that gives you the impression that CNN has been telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> it gives you the impression the New York Times has been telling the truth. Because the fake news are the alt, the alt-right, and the alt-left. And all you need to do is go to the non-alt center. <laughs> That's not true. Truth is buried. You need intellectual excavation. Beneath the discourses, what's hidden and concealed? What is latent? What are people trying to cover up? Alt-left, alt-right, or non-alt-center. So yes, there's a lot of lying going on and a whole host of different blogs and so forth and so on. But it's not as if you just turn to the establishment institutions that are under assault and find the truth. There's a reason why the establishment and the Republican Party went over went under. There's a reason why Brother Bernie putting the pressure on the establishment in the Democratic Party, it almost went under and he was not 
treated fairly, but that's another lecture. <laughs> There's a reason why the establishment and the corporate media is under contestation, and that's just not scandal-driven Fox News at the moment. They all are tied together, and people are feeling helpless, impotent, hopeless, and the choice is between, as we saw in 2016, Neoliberal disaster, neo-fascist catastrophe. <laughs> and the neoliberal disaster was our dear sister Hillary Clinton. <laughs> the sexism was real coming at her. We got to acknowledge that. There's no doubt about that. But it wasn't only that. There was also an element of detachment from ordinary people living in the elitist bubble to too often the Harvards and Yales and Princetons and Dartmouths and Berkeleys and Chicago's generate. So all you gotta do is connect to just folk in your bubble. They are the sophisticated ones. And one mark of their sophistication is always the excessive use of obviously. <laughs> obviously, 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 obviously. <laughs> it's not obvious to me. No, that's a sign of the in crowd. That's a sign of the chattering classes who have been formally educated in certain ways so they reinforces each other's sense of being smart. And what Du Bois is talking about has nothing to do with the land of dollars and smartness. It has to do with compassion and wisdom. Let the phones be smart. We've got to be wise and compassionate and self-critical. <laughs> The whole cult of smartness. The whole cult of smartness and obviously is part of the market soul craft. And it generates broader gaps and hiatuses between elites and educated sites and everyday people. And it's a very, very sad moment when that gap becomes so overwhelming that the rug is completely pulled from under the establishment, and the only thing left is an option of neo-fascist catastrophe. That was what most sad about 2016. That's why I'm still deeply upset in terms of uh, how my brother Bernie was treated, because I was thoroughly convinced that he had the gusto, that wonderful word of William Hazlitt. He had the, the insight and the power to generate enthusiasm against the enthusiastic folk behind Trump. The neoliberal project was running out of gas. The New York Times hadn't got the memo. I know Thomas Friedman and others, they hadn't got the memo. <laughs> they were convinced. But those of us who are out in the field, we could see it so clearly. See it so clearly, which meant what? More need for integrity in the face of oppression. More need for honesty in the face of deception. And Du Bois's third question, how shall decency respond to assault and attack? And we were talking about this again with the young, the young folk. And a sense of, oh my God, uh, all these white supremacist attacks that are so Microsocial and sometimes macrosocial, dealing with police brutality, dealing with these ugly stereotypes, not just on TV, but sometimes generated by the very young folk themselves and the worst of hip hop culture as opposed to the best of hip hop culture. It's got to be ways in which you can preserve your sense of decency. It's a spiritual and moral issue. And we've got to learn how to inhabit the spiritual and moral space that holds at arm's length those market sensibilities and market orientations. And they're always intertwined, they're always overlapping, but there's got to be some space, and you don't do it by yourself. You need groups, you need institutions. And that's why example, Brother Jeff Stout, who's now giving the Gifford Lectures, and that's like the Nobel Prize in philosophy. Just arrived yesterday, we taught a graduate course together. It had much to do with 
exemplarity as opposed to celebrity. You see, spiritual and moral exemplarity, examples as opposed to market-driven celebrities. And I tell my young folk all the time, you can just look at the juxtaposition of those who are highly visible. Back to music again. I love my dear sister Beyonce. She's one of the greatest entertainers in many ways. She's got a lot of energy, a lot of discipline. She's got a certain kind of genius. Unbelievable commitment. But she's not Aretha Franklin. <laughs> now, what's the difference between Beyonce and Aretha Franklin in terms of spiritual exemplarity, market-driven celebrity? That Aretha Franklin, when she shows up, all she needs is a microphone. She's not part of this culture of superficial spectacle. She doesn't have to ask her girls to be in formation. <laughs> <laughs> and she's not talking about black Bill Gates's. She's not talking about using her paper for revenge. We come from a people of justice, not revenge. We don't need to read Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice to know the difference between justice and revenge. Because if all we were driven by revenge, there wouldn't have been a Martin Luther King Jr. There wouldn't have been a Ida B. Wells Barnett. There wouldn't have been an A. Philip Randolph. There'd have been a civil war in America every generation. Because if you all terrorize us, we're going to terrorize you. And if we terrorize you, there's going to be civil war every generation. You ought to be lucky that we produce a Martin King and a Aretha. I tell my white brothers and sisters all the time, when you see Negroes, give them a standing ovation. Thank you for Martin. Thank you for Ida. You could have been different. <laughs> true. It's true. Could have been black versions of the Ku Klux Klan, black versions of ISIS, black versions of Al Qaeda, black versions of the Jewish Ergon. Oh, our rich Jewish tradition, all of its overwhelming prophetic practices still produce some Jewish terrorists, too. Begin was part of it. Oh, yes. Meaning what? Well, it's a complicated situation. Sometimes you got to revert to violence. We understand that. Nelson Mandela found as the spirit of the nation. He was also a terrorist in terms of attacking the property. They didn't kill any folk intentionally, but they did use violence. That's a complex co conversation about pacifism and just war. We love our Quakers, Mennonites. Desmond Tutu, Martin King, all pacifists. But even the Malcolm X's, full of love, but no pacifists. He still didn't call for just terrorizing white folk randomly. Not at all. Not at all. Meaning what? Meaning that when we talk about honesty, <coughs> these are subversive things these days. Last question, what does virtue do in the face of brute force? Back to Du Bois, house arrest, FBI surveillance. 1919, the Archibald Stevenson sat before the Senate and said the most destructive and dangerous person in America is Jane Addams. She was a darling of the liberal establishment. She was courageous. She was visionary. She was a pacifist. She opposed World War I. Many professors, the Charles Bemises and others, Charles Beard also resigned at Columbia over the dismissal of professors because of their opposition to World War I. So it's always fascinating to me to see these citadels of higher learning always talk about objectivity, value-free inquiry, and detached reflection. And as soon as war kicks in, they shift gears. Massive mobilization in order to defend the country and the flag. You say, how come? Because there's a catastrophe. Well, you know what? Indigenous people's been dealing with catastrophe since 1492. You know what? 
Working people have been dealing with catastrophe given the corporate greed that's escalated with 1% of the population own 22% of the wealth when I was the age of the undergrads and now that 1% owns 42%. That's catastrophe too. Oh, it's only when the catastrophe comes to your house, in your neighborhood, that all of a sudden objectivity is pushed aside. Oh, you black folk, all you black students and brown students, you all always so full of anger. That's not anger, that's commitment. <laughs> that's righteous indignation. There's catastrophe we dealing with. Yes, we all believe in self-criticism. We ought to, indeed. But when it comes to virtue in the face of brute force, and he's talking about the enabling virtue of courage, because all the other virtues are vacuous and empty without courage. But I'm calling fortitude with those moral and spiritual dimensions to courage. Where will we find that today? I thank God for the International Women's March. It was a wonderful way to start the Trump era. Wonderful way. And I believe in a united multiracial, multigender, multi-sexual orientational, multi-class coalition against the Trump administration and its various forms of cold-heartedness and mean-spiritedness, that fusion of billionaires and military elite and xenophobes who constitute his personnel. And there's always a sense in which personnel does partially, disproportionately dictate policy. So that coalition's crucial. It was a beautiful thing to see the women strike on March the 8th. It's a different slice of women. You got different forms of feminism, right? You got corporate feminism, <laughs> centrist feminism. Some of them leaning in, Sister Cheryl Steinberg. <laughs> Shoot, I've told her, I'm not leaning in. See, I'm a love warrior. If you're in love, you're not leaning in. You have dived in. You tell your wife, oh, honey, I'm just leaning in with you. She said, what? <laughs> <laughs> you better get on in here, brother. <laughs> I want all of you. Yeah, all of me. Uh-huh. Back to John Coltrane. Kenosis, giving it your all. Giving all that you have based on your mobilization of the resources of the past where tradition becomes unavoidable, but you have to be selective in your hermeneutical humility so that what you choose is something that gives you longevity with integrity and honesty and decency and with courage. And that's all we do as human beings. That's all we're going to do during the Trump era. Try to come together, overlap, tell the truth, have our various kinds of correspondences in terms of unity, but never unanimity. And we're going to tell the truth about where we are. You know, my dear brother White, I want to acknowledge my dear brother Derek White and his wonderful work that he's done. I don't know if he's here. And I want to acknowledge my dear sister Amy, sister Amy Bond as well, and her work that she's done. You got to lift up something folk in one's own context and say, oh, we are with you critically in the sense that we recognize that the best of what you are doing has something to do with this integrity and honesty and decency and courage. Doesn't take full agreement. And none of us ever want wholesale embrace. We take each other seriously by giving each other the right of being wrong so we can be empowered. That's what that learning how to die in order to learn how to live is all about. Does America have what it takes? It's an open question. Maybe the American given it is beginning to put pen to paper to write the decline and fall of the American empire. Melville had already put it forward. Moby Dick, Barlaby. Confidence may, maybe Melville is more prescient than Emerson. And if he is, we're going to need some Emersonian energy to overthrow that Melvillean challenge, which is another way of saying that the blues tradition 
because Melville is a vanilla blues man. Ralph Ellison says the blues ain't nothing but a personal narrative of a catastrophe lyrically expressed. Nobody loves me but my mama and she might be jiving too. <laughs> That's the king of the blues. That's B.B. King. That's the B-side of the thrill is gone. It's another kind of catastrophe we won't get into right now. <laughs> but America's dealing with multiple catastrophes, ecological catastrophes around the corner. Nuclear catastrophe with Russia as the Cold War escalates. The moral and spiritual catastrophe we've been talking about. The economic catastrophe of escalating wealth inequality and income inequality. Do we have what it takes? We never know. It all depends on the kind of human beings we choose to be, the kind of vocations we adopt, the kind of voices we raise, the kind of courage we exhibit. T.S. Eliot says, ours is in the trying. And the rest is not our business. No one of us in control. No group is in control. The empire may simply have run out of gas. We don't know. But some of us are going to go down swinging like Ella Fitzgerald and Muhammad Ali, full of that commitment to what Du Bois was writing about. Thank you all so very much. <laughs>